My name is David Shu. I'm a French Cambodian film director and film producer based here in Phnom Penh. And it's my pleasure to discuss today in presence of Miguel Ceruco, who is a Filipino writer, novelist, journalist, and currently professor at the New York University Abu Dhabi. Okay, so the topic uh, that we're going to try to debate and hopefully discuss with you deals with culture and identity, especially how art uh, can help us contemplate contemplating our past, present, and future, with maybe the challenge for ASEAN artists of how can they take ownership of their culture and identity. But first, I would like to share with you some personal story of mine that can maybe illustrate the topic of today. Both parents were born in Cambodia here, and they moved to France in 1973 to study with the idea of going back to uh, Cambodia to, to, to live. But in 1975, as you may know, the Khmer Rouge took power in the country, and they were stuck to stay in France. So that's how I was born and grew up in France in total ignorance of the language, the culture, and the history of the country of my parents. But somehow, it's art who bring me back to Cambodia, if I may say. Um, I started around 20 to develop a passion for cinema, starting to make film and choosing that I wanted to become a filmmaker in my career. And then I remembered a past story, a family story that my grandfather, who I never met because he died before the Khmer Rouge, used to be a big film producer in Cambodia. That's the reason why I set up in Cambodia in 2009 and 10 for the first time of my life, making some research, which ended up on my first documentary named Golden Slumbers about the lost golden age of Cambodian cinema from the 60s and 70s. And since 2009, I've been living back and forth between Paris and Phnom Penh, opening also a production company here, developing films by emerging Cambodian directors. And last year, I released my last film, which this time was a fiction film named Diamond Islands, which this time uh, tried to reflect and illustrate the struggle between youth today in modern Cambodia and the modernization and the huge changes that Cambodia is living through. Now, going back to the question, so that's few images of my first film, Golden Slumbers, and my last film, Diamond Alone, about youth today in cultural sites and future of Cambodia. Going back to the question of how art can reflect our identity, I think making these two films really made me realize how art is a fantastic tool to explore the past and the present. Every country in Southeast Asia has some very complex history dealing somehow with colonization, dictator, and sometimes genocide. And of course, art is a fantastic tool to explore that history, to trying to explore and define and portray the different layers of complexity of the history, and to try to enlighten for the new generation this story and how to give them some knowledge about their own culture and identity. But also art, I think, is a fantastic tool to explore our present time. I'm giving an example, uh, a story I used to hear about that architect who is building this new building and he's going to see this, the facade of his building in the making every day on the same angle, but after, after many days, he just start to lose the connection with what he's doing because he's not understanding it anymore. And then he have this clever move of just stepping a little few meters away, taking another angle to another perspective, a little further to his building and suddenly he reconnects with his building as if he could see it again for the first time and understanding what he's doing. I strongly believe that art is exactly about that, giving a representation of our reality from a different perspective, the perspective of the artist, that suddenly it's going to give us some glance of our reality that we forget to see because we're too surrounded by it. And so by this switch in perspective, we can really understand better what we are doing, where we're living in, and what we are surrounded by. So that's, 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 that's the thing, I think, how the mission of the artist is really to try to tackle the society we're living in, try to portray the population, the youth, the changes that we're living in. So that's how I could say art can help us reflecting our identity. But on the question of how art can help us building our identity, that's another question. I think it's, yeah, I can ask this for myself in Cambodian cinema. What is Cambodian cinema exactly? Um, especially in that context that Cambodian film industry is just rebuilding itself now with new emerging directors making films. But what would be called Cambodian cinema? It's, it's, it's a complex question and it's more than just filming a territory for me. If I think of French New Wave from the 60s, I have a precise idea what it is. If I think of Italian neorealism from the 50s, I know exactly what it is. If I think of, think of independent Filipino film today, I can see those films tackle social, tackling social issues in a very realistic approach, so I see what it is. So what could be 
the emergence of a Cambodian cinema? Actually, I don't have an answer to that question, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts about it. But maybe opening the question is already allowing yourself to finding an answer, because if we don't ask the question, the tendency is, of course, to recopy the mainstream industry, which, of course, today is an American blockbuster that everybody loves and everybody wants to reproduce, but to opening yourself in what can I build for my own country of a nationalist, which is not nationalistic, but nationalist cinema and art, can open ourselves to maybe explore singular voices, explore our own freedom to really understand who we are and what we can do. And the future will speak for it. Thank you very much. My name is Miguel Sihuko. I'm a writer from the Philippines. And my job is, I'm a storyteller. I write things down, I write words down on little slips of paper. So I hope you'll allow me today to tell you a story. It is one of identity and culture, which is our topic, obviously. But it is also a story of process and purpose, both of which obsess the artist and anyone really who creates anything, such as all of you here today. My story begins growing up in Vancouver, in a Filipino household. Our identity was, of course, Filipino, even if we had moved to Canada for a safer life. One evening in 1986, I found my parents transfixed to the television. On the screen, Filipinos of all kinds had flooded the streets of our capital, Manila, demanding democracy. The plundering Marcoses had fled after 14 years of brutal dictatorship. I remember, I remember my mother saying two things. I just cannot believe it, she kept saying. And we can go home now, she said. At least that's how I remember it. I was only nine years old, but I do remember thinking, aren't we already home? We soon moved back to the land of my birth, which was both foreign and familiar. One day in 1989, I came home from school to find my parents transfixed again to the television. On the screen, Chinese students had flooded the streets of their capital, Beijing, demanding democracy. But unlike in the Philippines, they were massacred by authorities. As coverage continued, uh, one image that emerged over the next few hours and days stuck with me over the course of my lifetime. It is of a man in a white shirt and dark trousers carrying a plastic bag. He's standing in front of four tanks. In this photo, I realize that there are two heroes. The citizen who refused to move, even when faced with a machine of violence, and the fellow countrymen inside the machine of violence who refused to harm someone whose only violation was to stand in dissent in a public space. Since that day in 1989, a lot has changed for me. I am now a writer, a journalist, a professor. I write novels. I report on society's broken systems and how they came to be used by the powerful against the disempowered. I teach people how to find their voices so that they too can raise them and be heard. But what has never changed is my search for home and for an identity that has meaning. I'm constantly questioning the value of my work, all too aware of its limitations. Maybe because I'm an artist in a diasporic world, or maybe it's just because I'm simply a citizen in an interconnected world. But we can all agree, in that world, things need to urgently be changed. You do remember how your elders would ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? You remember that, right? Your goal was, was perhaps to be a, a businessman, or a doctor, or a lawyer. But what if you were asked instead, not what do you want to be when you grow up, but what are the problems that you want to fix? Perhaps your goals would have been different. Directly learning the skills that you needed to apply yourselves to fixing those problems that concerned you, such as inequality, intolerance, climate change, or all that long list of things we all agree need fixing. Not being, doing. Words matter. I tell my students to stop asking how to write. I tell them, quit that. How, how do I write? How do I write stories? How do I, how do I become a great published author? Practice will teach them that. I tell them instead, 
that they should ask why they write, because that will sustain them through all the inevitable hardships that they will face. And that's why I'm here today at the World Economic Forum, because I have the radical idea that words matter. They define our culture, but they also define our purpose, both as individuals and as a society. If words are that essential then, shouldn't they be wielded by everyone freely? Shouldn't they be available so that nobody is underprivileged in being heard? Abusive leaders will first work to discredit, then hinder, then censor dissent and any inconvenient voices. We've seen it all throughout history, claiming that it's for the good of the country. But we have to remind them, a voice is a vote. By speaking out, we are actually standing in front of tanks. I'm here today as a storyteller. I believe in the value of stories because they define who we are. From scripture to cinema, they contain the wisdom and truths of our society. Stories even prove that good does outweigh evil because even the most brutal despot will tell himself the narrative of his own goodness and the nobility of his own intentions. How does a mass murderer sleep at night by telling himself the story that he is saving the world from those who deserve to die? We as a society, however, must guard against those narratives that seek to justify those who wield power over the powerless. Not only must we write our history properly and document the present honestly, we must shape the future by refusing to allow the powerful to redefine what is right and wrong. Yes, to have a voice is to have a vote. Discourse allows us to discuss those problems that we want to fix and how together we can fix them. Identity isn't us being who we are. Identity must be us doing what needs to be done to create a better society for all, not just for the few. This image of a man in front of these tanks has been censored in its own country. Of course, look at it, how eloquently it speaks. It tells us of defiance, of courage, of heroism, dressed in the everyday clothes of a man in a white shirt carrying his shopping. But if we step back and look at it more broadly, we see that the little splash makes ripples, and those ripples then become waves. And those waves can actually reach farther than we might ever imagine possible. But really, we are two young men, well, he's younger than I am, um, in search for identity within our cultures, searching for meaning, searching for purpose, which is not just something that artists do, but I think, I know that, that it's something that humans do, whether we're in business or the arts, whether we're in politics uh, or any other profession. So um, please, let's, let's have that conversation now. I've seen Diamond Island, and it's a kind of very, obviously, detailed look at what these kind of young Cambodian men are sort of um, their emotions and, and what they're going through. And obviously on the subject of identity, given that you grew up in France, that was obviously very different from your reality. So how did you kind of go about connecting with your Cambodian roots in that more kind of deep level, which was very different to your own experiences? It's true that somehow we shared that in common, that, that to be a little outsider observer of a reality that bring us to try to explore, even though I was not born in Cambodia, so my relationship to Cambodia is very different than uh, Miguel relation with Philippines, for sure, with the Philippines, for sure. I had to assume also this outsider point of view of mine, not thinking that I was myself just a Cambodian director filming Cambodia, but assuming what was my own history, and to integrate, I think, in the film, the point of view of observing things from a different perspective. And again, as I was saying in the talk, I believe that that different perspective helped me also to try to catch things that maybe when I was showing the film to common people, sometimes they really react very strongly saying that, oh, it's exactly us, this little gesture, but, but I didn't even notice that we're doing that, but we're exactly doing that. And that's what I'm talking about. Sometimes having a little different step forward or step backward can help us to see things and to notice things that when we're too close to reality, we just don't see. So that was my point. Assuming my kind of outsider point of view and not lying to myself to have an insider point of view. And from this outsider point of view, try to really work, of course, and observe 
and, and investigate to try to give a representation that I think accurate of reality. I don't know if you want to jump on that. How do you match and how do you deal with that being out of the Philippines or writing about the Philippines? As an artist, you're always the outsider. That's both the curse and in a way a blessing that, that allows us to have a perspective. That, that angst, that, that, that feeling that we have to overcompensate for our outsider status means that we are also very intent on being responsible in, in being active, in, in portraying things fairly. At least in my purpose, in, in my art, that's, that's what I try to do. Um, there's always this question of authenticity. How can you be an authentic Filipino artist if you only if you were born in the Philippines, but but you grew up abroad until you were, you know, ten or eleven years old. You know, the the world is diasporic. Um, the the Filipino experience is now global. We were once colonized, and now we're colonizing the world, uh, raising generations of everybody's children in every culture, building their buildings, um, and taking back those ideas, like like the old Filipinos, the Ilustrados. Who, who helped create the, the Philippine Revolution once did. And, you know, we're 9 million Filipinos living abroad. That's, that's the population of many countries. So this idea of insider-outsider um, is very much really just a question of bridging that gap and being very intent with it. To be an authentic writer means writing about your authentic experience, and that's what I do. Um, I don't go writing about... The, the, the things that I know nothing about. I actually write about the elite, privileged, diasporic Filipinos, which are very often, by many writers who, who do not come from that class, very often portrayed two-dimensionally. And I believe that even if I am writing from a point of privilege, by exposing it honestly, by discussing it, by talking about the failings of the privileged class um, and the systems that they have not just been party to, but, but uh, perpetuated, uh, I think there is value in that. And I think my outsider status really does make me more aware and more engaged, very much ironically so. I founded an NGO recently with a friend and basically our project is called Our Mongolian Dream. And um, we basically want to define the Mongolian dream through a grassroots campaign to listen to everybody. And the biggest challenge I'm finding is that even if you want to give people a voice, they don't know what their voice is. And so how do we kind of draw out these voices and then build that up into one kind of direction and values? It's a very complex question, but I'll offer a very simple answer. How do we empower those voices? I, I believe we empower those voices by ensuring that the powers that be are not able to quash those voices. Freedom of speech is constantly under attack in many different countries around the world. This idea of freedom of speech must be responsible speech is an alluring one, but who gets to dictate what is responsible? It's the powerful. So I think we begin by ensuring that those voices are never silenced, and then we start off from there to starting to empower those voices through so many different other programs, skills, education, um, and just even just the respect for their words, uh, for their respect, for the respect for their right to speak out. Thank you. I think I understand really your point because I, I, I felt with the same struggle here in Cambodia, but it's a very general one, I'm sure. It's more about, I think, the weakness of not having um, the good tools to, to, to fight in that very strong struggle in which we're so surrounded by images and, and how all these propagandists thing just feed us and make us being lazy of not trying to re-question and not even having the courage to re-question and I think I think it's just a very long process and a long way to go and, and, and that's basically the commitment and we're putting into it even though sometimes we can be discouraged which sometimes I can feel as well personally but I think we just need to go on that way believing in that of the changes that that will have as an impact maybe for just few people but these few people maybe in the future will be the people that will make a bigger change. So I think it's really about this very personal commitment of just going that way because you know how, and to maybe try to give to the people the tools to, to, de to deconstruct the, the, all the speeches that surround them at some time we don't even aware to be manipulated by all it's surrounding us. So we're just repeating the mainstream without having the consciousness of just being repeating them. So 
giving us always, so building the brain, of course, and having this education. I'm always telling to young filmmakers that to learn how to use a camera, the technical aspect of it, which upsets everybody, I think we can, and no offense to cinematographers, but we can learn how to use a camera after two or three weeks. But to learn how to use the language of cinema, to build your own language of cinema, that takes a whole life for every filmmaker in the world, and that's what we should focus on. But I think it's, it's about commitment and not giving up that we can actually make an actual change.